But on to our first presentation, From Big Bang to Big Mac, Stable Isotopes in the Fabric of the World. Uh, Carlos promises us we will have three simple observations that he will share with us that will help provide insights about our world. Uh, Carlos is professor, uh, a professor in the Department of Zoology and Physiology, as I mentioned. He's a native of Spain. He received his undergraduate training at the University of Mexico, and his doctoral work was done at the University of Florida. He has taught at Princeton University, the University of Arizona, and now the University of Wyoming. Here he is returning. He's come back twice. Once. You've you come back once. You were at the University of Wyoming. You liked it so well you came back. So we welcome you today. And we really Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's really an, an honor for me to be here. I, I, I think that what the Wyoming Humanities Council does and the Sarah University idea it, it does is, is, is absolutely splendid. I have no idea of who invited me to speak here, um, <laughs> but whoever did, I'm very thankful. So my talk has a very simple general message that is summarized in the subtitle of this slide, and the, which is Stable Isotopes and the Fabric of Life. What I will do is try to convince you that we can detect all sorts of subtle, interesting, and I think important interconnections if we count the neutrons in atoms. Uh, my talk will include a bit of cosmology and geochemistry, a bit of archaeology, and I'm terrified because Bob Kelly is here and he knows archaeology, I don't, and uh, a touch of popular culture and a lot of biology. And I was able to weave all these seemingly disparate elements because counting the number of neutrons in atoms I never thought as a biologist that I would spend my life doing that, um, is something that is really useful to do. So my talk is in some sense um, a comment on a statement by Richard Dick Feynman, the famous bongo player, no, famous physicist, but he was also a bongo player. And I think that all scientists should play an instrument because it keeps you humble. Um, we tend to be arrogant and uh, by playing something you become more humble. So when someone asked him about the most important discovery in science, he said, Everything is made out of atoms. That is the key hypothesis, the most important hypothesis in science. Now, atomic theories are very old. Lucretius, the Roman philosopher, proposed an atomic theory over two millennia ago. Uh, he did it rather more poetically than Feynman. He said, the ultimate stock we have devised to name procreant atoms, matter, seeds of things or primal bodies, as primal to the world. I would like to point out, we are so used to accepting the, that things are made out of atoms. If you go to a, an elementary school and you ask them, what are things made of? They will tell you they are made out of atoms. Uh, that we forget that many scientists uh, were skeptical about the notion that things were made out of atoms until the end of the 19th century. What is the origin? Where do atoms come from? And the best answer that we have so far is that atoms originated uh, with the universe in the Big Bang about 14 billion years ago. So at the beginning of the Big Bang, it was very, very hot, and all matter existed only as elementary particles. Uh, we had this really hot, very condensed uh, soup of quarks. And uh, I love that image. I, I, mean, I think it's a great one. Uh, protons and neutrons, which are the ingredients of the nuclei of atoms, formed as soon as the universe expanded and cooled to, you know, it became pretty cool to about one billion degrees Kelvin. Um, the nuclei of the first elements form between one and, and three minutes. Let me see if I have a... Between one and three minutes, about... This thing doesn't work. Well, about there. <laughs> so, uh, so, protons and neutrons reacted with one another to form hydrogen and its isotope deuterium. And I will explain what an isotope is in just a second. Rapidly following this reaction was the addition of another proton, and, um, which produced helium, which I am not showing there. So the Big Bang generated only the light elements, um, which are hydrogen and helium. And I, I would like to use hydrogen, which is the simplest element, to introduce the chemical language that we need for this talk and the notion of an isotope. Hydrogen has a single proton and has a single electron buzzing around like a bee um, around this uh, proton. And the element hydrogen comes in three different flavors. The simplest one is proteum, which is shown as the first one uh, to the left. Um, 
I would like to point out one interesting and, and profound observation, which is that uh, not all elements come in the same uh, flavor. Deuterium, for example, which is the second one, um, has a proton, once again in blue, and a neutron in red, whereas tritium has, again, a single proton, which is what defines hydrogen and two neutrons. All these atoms are atoms of hydrogen. They all have one proton and one electron. They're atoms of the same element, but they are a tiny bit different because they differ in the number of neutrons that they have in their nuclei. They can have none, they have one, or they can have two, and we call them isotopes. Just to remind you a bit of Chemistry 101, the number of protons defines an element. It defines its atomic number and therefore its position in the periodic table. The number of neutrons defines an isotope. It defines the atomic mass of an atom. So hydrogen is light, deuterium is a little heavier, and tritium is even heavier. And I will use these terms light and heavy uh, a lot throughout this talk. Uh, one more thing I need to mention is that when I talk about isotopes, people usually think about radiation and dangerous things, etc. Hydrogen and deuterium, which is 2H, are stable. They were created during the Big Bang and they're still around. Tritium, in contrast, is unstable. Uh, it decays by releasing one electron from one of the neutrons and becomes helium-3. This whole talk will be about stable isotopes, those that do not decay. This graph shows something interesting. It shows um, the abundance of chemical elements in our solar system. And it shows two things that are important for this talk. The first one is that the elements that were manufactured in the Big Bang, which are hydrogen and helium, um, are the most abundant ones. And they are followed by carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. Uh, this matter a matters a lot to a biologist like me because hydrogen, carbon, and nitrogen are the elements of life. Imagine that we could do something, this is kind of blasphemous, but that we could represent a man and a single enormous molecule. And this would be the formula for this man. The man would have 375 million atoms of hydrogen, 132 million atoms of oxygen, etc., etc., etc. Note that a full 99% of the atoms in this person um, come only from four elements, which are the four most common elements in the universe. They are hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. I told you that hydrogen was formed in the Big Bang. Oxygen and carbon and nitrogen were formed in alchemic furnaces. Um, alchemists were the forefathers of chemists. They tried to create elements, new elements, especially gold, by burning the hell out of other elements in alchemical um, furnaces. I, I really like this tenure um, because the office of, of the alchemist just looks like mine. It's as disorganized. <laughs> so some things seem to never, never, ever change. Um, so the alchemical furnaces that I'm talking about, of course, are not built by alchemists. They are in stars. Their elements, such as carbon and uh, nitrogen and a bunch of others, are formed by the fusion of the light elements. Um, so what, here we have three um, atoms of helium uh, that are coalescing to form carbon. Um, so stars such, are, such as our sun age and turn into red giants, which then explode and form planetary nebulae, which then sometimes coalesce and form planetary systems, which then sometimes, if we are lucky, create life. Um, sometimes, uh, and I think this happens more often than we think, poets translate scientific concepts much better than scientists. Ted Hughes, who used to be Red Britain's Lord Poet, wrote that those stars, and you might recognize that, uh, that landscape, are the fleshed forebears of these dark hills, bowed like laborers and of my blood. This fragment is known only, I think, absolutely beautiful. It is also scientifically very accurate. Uh, in one of the anthems of my generation, Johnny Mitchell <laughs> said the same thing. I am sure that many of you know this song, and I'm not going to make you sing it. Uh, but she said, we are stardust, we are golden, we are billion-year carbon, and we got to get ourselves back into the garden. So the alchemical furnaces of stars not only made elements, they also produced their isotopes. Um, so for example, carbon was produced in a light form, carbon-12 and carbon-13, nitrogen in nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15, etc. Does that work? Thank you. 
these laser pointers are terrible because they show that you're really nervous, right? I mean, even if, even if, you, if you, know, you try to be really steady. Um, so it is a really nice thing, and I, I hope to demonstrate this, that we have stable isotopes for the most common elements of life. Hydrogen has a light element and a heavy isotope, which we call deuterium. Um, carbon has a light and a heavy form, so does oxygen and so does um, carbon. I, I, I really hope to convince you, once again, that the existence of these heavy and light isotopes is really very useful. It makes a lot of science possible. Remember that I showed you the chemical composition of a man. Let's now turn to a woman. If we look more closely, what we find is that we can further subdivide this chemical composition into its isotopic components. Most of the atoms of oxygen in this woman are of the most common light form, oxygen-16. She has about 65 pounds of light oxygen. It's a 55-kilogram woman. But her body also contains a handful, literally a handful, about this much, um, of the heavier oxygen isotope. It's about 25 ounces. And the same is the case for carbon. The woman would have 25 pounds of the light carbon, carbon-12, and about 5 ounces of the heavy uh, isotope, which is carbon-13, which is more rare. And at this point, I really hope that you're wondering, OK, first of all, how the hell do they know? Right? I mean, how do they know that there are all these isotopes there? And the other one that is perhaps more important is this is really weird. This is science gone mad. We have these scientists spending huge amounts of money, because doing this analysis is very expensive, finding out exactly the number of protons in a woman's body. It's a bit like uh, people in the Middle Ages were discussing how many angels you can put on the head of a pin. Um, before I justify those two questions, uh, let me tell you how we do it, how we count um, the protons in a woman's body. And for that, we use a mass spectrometer. And this is a diagram of a mass spectrometer. Briefly, what we do is we take a representative sample of the woman's body, a, a, a nail would do, or a piece of hair will do, and then we burn the hell out of it. And uh, after it's burned, we take these molecules and we fire them into a tube. And we gave them an electrical charge. And this tube, you can see there, has, a, a, has an electromagnet that creates an electric field. So what you have is these atoms, these molecules, flying at very, very high speeds along this tube. And then they get deflected. And the light ones get deflected more than the than the heavy ones, and we detect it at the end in a, in a detector and count the number of molecules that hit one place or the other one. It's a bit, I think the best way to explain it is, imagine that you had Tiger Woods hitting golf balls that are heavy or light. Well, the heavy ones would fall closer and the light ones would fall further uh, away. Does this make sense, how, how we do this? And I place this slide here quite proudly. The University of Wyoming has an absolutely superb stable isotope lab. I think that is one of the top five stable isotopes in the world. And I would, I would make the bet that is one of the top three or two or perhaps even the top stable isotope lab in the country. Um, we have worked very hard to build it, and I'm very, very proud of it. It doesn't look quite as psychedelic as it shows this. You know, every time that you do a science photograph, photographers want it, the colors to look really bizarre. But well, that's the way it is. it is. So let's apply now what we have learned about atoms and isotopes. Let's answer the question, why on earth does this matter? And I will tell you two stories. One is about how we can use isotopes to track animal movements um, and in forensics. And the other one is about corn, it, how important this plant is and has been for humans for a long, long time. Mm. So let's begin by talking about isoscapes. And these are not Mickey Mouse heads. They are representations of a water molecule with its big red oxygen in the middle and the two hydrogen ears. And um, the, butter, the water molecule can be isotopically light, as in that corner, if it has oxygen-16 and hydrogen as, as, as in, as in the center and hydrogen as the ears. Or it can be isotopically heavy, as in the upper corner. It has deuterium and oxygen-18. These are two extremes, and you can have all sorts of combinations in between of different masses isotopic masses of this water molecule. Now, there's something quite interesting, which is that heavy and light water have very different physical properties. As you all know, ice that is made with light water floats, right? Well, if you make ice with heavy water, it sinks. I, I showed that to my undergrads, and it never fails to freak them out, which is kind of a neat thing. Um, I want you to imagine for a second now that you're at the foothills of a big coastal mountain range, such as the Andes, or the Sierras in California. 
So what you have is water evaporates from the ocean and forms clouds. And these clouds move upslope and start dropping some of their water. One of the peculiar things about this water with different isotopes in it is that it behaves differently. So water that contains the heavy isotopes precipitates more readily. Uh, therefore, the cloud becomes isotopically lighter. And I use a lighter color to signify that it becomes isotopically lighter as it moves um, up the slope. As the cloud continues to move upslope, it keeps dumping its heavy isotope and becomes isotopically lighter and lighter. The result is that the composition of rainwater along this mountain range differs. We have documented this very, very well in the Andes now. So at sea level, the water is isotopically heavy. It contains a lot of deuterium and oxygen 18. Up on top, it contains much less of those heavy isotopes. The same happens when you move across a continent. Um, rainwater tends to be isotopically uh, heavy uh, in coastal areas. And then as you move inland, you end up with isotopic water that becomes much, much lighter. And the result is this, I think, stunning and stunningly beautiful isotopic landscape. We call them isoscapes in the lab. Heavy rainwater is represented in orange in the hot color, and light water is represented in the cooler color on top. So if you move from Florida uh, to the Yukon, what you find is that rainwater contains less and less of the heavy components of oxygen and deuterium. Does this make sense so far? Um, this pattern is not only, I think, beautiful, it is really very useful. We can use it, for example, to study migration. Traditionally, we study migration by putting bands in animals and then finding out when these banded animals are recovered. This is literally, I think, science on a wing and a prayer. And, and let me, I, I mean, I've done this for a long, long, long time, and it's, the, it, it's, it's a bit, um, it's like, like throwing a, a little bottle with a message into the ocean. Uh, let me show you the, the data that you get. Um, let me just focus on American red starts. Over 45 years, over a quarter of a million red starts were banded. And of those, only 256 were recovered. That's less than 0.1%. That's less than one in 1,000. This is really science on a wing and a prayer. On a prayer. This is, uh, it's very frustrating. Uh, banding is just not a very efficient way to go about studying migration. We do better with things that we shoot, right? Canada geese, mallards, and pintails. <laughs> We get about 10%, but less than 15% recoveries. It's not a very efficient way of doing science. But this is what we had once upon a time. Now, we have a lovely continental isoscape. And we know a few more things. And I'm going to simplify things a bit here. But this is roughly, roughly true. We know that the isotopic composition of food gets incorporated into the tissues of animals. Isotopically, animals are what they eat. Also, what they eat reflects the isotopic composition of rainwater. Now, songbirds, such as this little warbler, molt their flight feathers after they breed. And feathers are very cool because they are more or less inert. They don't change in chemical composition after they are deposited. Therefore, one thing you can do is you can go to, say, Guatemala and catch a bird there. Then you just, you don't have to do anything. You just pluck a feather. And then you can find out where in the continent the bird is which is, I think, a lovely thing. You end up with big errors, but you can make a very good guess about how this is working. Um, and you don't have to kill the bird. And uh, it, it is, uh, the way I think to see this is that with isotopes, every single bird is a banded bird. Everything you catch is banded, it has a signal. I am simplifying things a bit, but this method has proven to be very useful. It has been used in a large number of migratory birds, such as this western tanager and the bulk oriole. But I would like to emphasize just one that I, 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 a study that I like particularly well, which is the monarch butterfly. Monarch butterflies have really complicated lives. Um, they start um, their lives feeding on milkweed. Then they grow one generation of butterflies, which then lay their eggs on milkweed again, and then they disappear. They fly off. And um, they appear in huge masses in, um, in central Mexico. I hope you see in this slide uh, this orange tinge. Can you see that? Um, that is not dead trees as we are used to in Wyoming these days. These are hundreds of thousands of, um, of butterflies in, 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 in central Mexico. So. Um, for a long time, people knew that there were large aggregations of butterflies in the winter in Mexico. And there are these little 
groups of butterflies in California. So if you use isotopes, what you discover is something, and you just take the wings of the butterflies, what you find is that 95% of all the butterflies in Mexico come from the United States, and 50% come from that really small area in the, in the Midwest. Um, the bulk, I, I, I hope to emphasize this, the bulk of monarch butterflies from North America that live in hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of acres, spend the winter in a couple of hundred acres in central Mexico in the forests. And I placed this image here for a reason. First of all, to emphasize how dense these colonies are. You can see them from an airplane. And the second is to point out the dependence of monarchs on forests. Uh, and note that these forests are uh, surrounded by cultivated fields. Uh, the monarchs need forests for a, a very important reason, which is that if they're exposed to the cold air of the sky, they freeze. However, if it gets too hot, they increase their metabolic rate, they start flying more, and they burn their fat, and therefore they cannot migrate back into the United States. So they need the forests. Um, this image showed changes in forest cover in the area where monarchs spend the winter from the 70s to the beginning of the century. Uh, the orange tinge that you might be able to see shows where the colonies are. The forest cover decreased by about 50% in these 20 years. This rate of deforestation stopped. No, it didn't stop. It was reduced when this place was declared a national park in Mexico. But deforestation continues. This is an, become, has become a dangerous area, and it's very hard to stop uh, someone from cutting a tree when they have an AK-47. Um, I remind you that stable isotopes clearly demonstrate that the butterflies that spend the winter here are the bulk of monarchs of the United States. If these forests in Mexico disappear, we will lose a remarkable, not only a, a bunch of individuals of a nice species, but a remarkable phenomenon. Um, so stable isotopes show something interesting. Isotopically, there is a piece of the American Midwest that flies over to Mexico to spend the winter. Monarchs, like other migratory animals, are connecting our continent. They really are connecting our continent. So this is another study that I really like. A group of researchers at the University, this is something we didn't do, at the University of Utah traveled throughout the country and visited thousands of barber shops. Uh, and they collected hair before it was swept. They did this because they didn't have to get permission from NIH or anything to do the study. You know, once you put hair in the floor, it's waste and people can use it. And then they constructed these human uh, hair isoscapes. Again, the heavy isotope is shown in the hot color, and the light isotope is shown in the pale color. And um, I think it's a beautiful geographical pattern, but you might ask yourselves, why on earth do you want to measure a person's hair isotopic composition? And do this for thousands and thousands and thousands of individuals, and then put them on a map. Well, the reason is forensics. Imagine that you find a dead person, a stiff, somewhere. <laughs> uh, well, you can take a, 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 a sample of this person, put it in a mass spectrometer, count neutrons, and you can know if the person is an outsider, and you can make a very good guess about more or less where the person came from. Of course, as you can imagine, the DEA is beginning to wisen up, right, and use isotopes to find out the geographical sources of drugs. So isos isoscapes can be incredibly useful forensic tools. So let's talk about corn and beer. Um, so the second set of stories has to do with corn, which is, I think, the plant that has more thoroughly domesticated us. Uh, for isoscapes, we focused, whoa. For isoscapes, we focused on, on water and um, hydrogen and oxygen. Now we will focus on carbon dioxide, CO2. It's a molecule that has become controversial because of its contribution to climate change. Once again, we can have light carbon dioxide that has carbon-12 instead of in its carbon, or we can have heavy uh, CO2 that contains carbon-13. At some point or another, most of the carbon in our bodies was atmospheric carbon dioxide. Plants grab carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use the energy of the sun to transform it into organic materials. This is what photosynthesis does. It grabs CO2 from the atmosphere, let me repeat. It grabs some water from the soil, a bit of sunshine as a source of energy, and it makes uh, organic materials and oxygen. Plants make organic stuff, we eat plants, or we eat animals that eat plants, and we get all the carbon. Um, 
uh, this is actually, you know, I told you that we are made out of stardust. Actually, we are made of atmospheric gases, mostly. Um, there is a little isotopic quirk to the story. It happens that many, not all, but many plants, prefer CO2 that is of the light form. They prefer their CO2 light. Um, they do not like CO2 that has carbon-13, the heavy isotopes. What this means is that the tissues of many plants are isotopically light, and we call these plants C3. Just remember that because I will use it as a, as a shorthand for this. All these vegetables in my garden, believe it or not, we can grow vegetables in Laramie, um, cabbages, beans, and zucchinis are isotopically light. Now, not all plants are isotopically light. For reasons that I can explain to those of you that like biochemistry, um, there are many plants that don't mind heavy carbon. They eat heavy carbon perfectly fine. And corn is a very good example. It is much less choosy in the, carbon that it, in the CO2 that it takes isotopically. It takes both light and heavy carbon from the atmosphere. And we call these plants C4. Now, a typical Native American garden always included what people call the three sisters, beans, corns, and squash. Beans and squash are isotopically light. They have lots of carbon-12. And corn is isotopically relatively heavy because it has a lot more carbon-13. And this is a useful observation that I will use now to evaluate scientifically a Mayan myth. The popol vuh, which I, I, I hope many of you have heard about, is one of the greatest creation myths. In it, we learn the origins of the ancient Maya, which is the great civilization that flourished in the Yucatan Peninsula and Central America for over a thousand years. In the popol vuh, we read that the gods manufactured people out of mud, but it didn't work out. It melted away, it was soft, it did not move, it had no strength, its sight was blurred, it had no mind. Quickly it soaked water and could not stand. And so they broke up and destroyed their creation. Then they tried wood. Wood was better, but these humans did not have souls nor minds. They did not remember their creator, their maker. They walked in all four aimlessly. So immediately the wooden figures were annihilated destroyed, broken up, and killed. But then the gods found the ideal material. Of corn, they made their flesh. Only dough of corn went into the flesh of first fathers, and the people of the corn persisted. So when viewed through an isotopic lens, the archaeological record tells a story that is remarkably, remarkably similar to the one written in the Popol Vuh. In this graph, I plotted the corn content in, as reflected in human bones in archaeological uh, records in several periods in the history of the Maya. So before the Mayan Empire, when they were hunter-gatherers, they included very little corn. They probably included all these ingredients in their diet. As you progress through the Mayan Empire, even to historical samples in the modern day, what you find is a great increase in the content of corn in the bones of, this, of these people. Um, so it reveals an increased reliance of corn that persists to this day. The carbon in bones, I think, tells us that the Popol Vuh was right. The Mayans were made out of corn. And I, I, will, I will claim today that many of us in this room are also made out of corn. Uh, but before we do so, let's talk about beer. Um, in this talk, I will try to convince you that light beers are heavy. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, beer is probably the oldest fermented drink. It's a very well, very well loved beverage. You probably know this well, well known quote by uh, Benjamin Franklin that beer is the best evidence we have that God loves us. Um, the, the Sumerians even had a, a, a goddess of beer called Ninkasi, and they wrote hymns and poems uh, to her. I should mention that Ninkasi lives, she lives in a microbrewery in Portland. They make incredibly good beer. It's, it's, worth, it's worth trying. Um, there's even a clay tar uh, tablet uh, with an ancient beer recipe. And here I would like to just point out that this Sumerian beer is like the best beers in that all the ingredients come from plants that are C3 or are isotopically light. You include things like barley, honey, dates, and so on. So what I would like to do now is show you uh, the isotopic composition of beers in the United States. And this, this plot shows the price of beer in this axis, and here the content of corn. So here you have the cheap beers, which tend to be uh, light beers. 
and they are isotopically heavy, they contain a lot of corn. Whereas the European beers tend to be more expensive and they tend to be isotopically light. Um, they tend to have almost no corn at all, or no corn at all. Um, this is what we call the Coors-Guinness relationship um, <laughs> in, in the lab. Um, now, given my ancestry, and I'm not Spanish, I'm Mexican, uh, just to mention this, sorry, <laughs> the correction, but uh, this is something that, I, it's kind of embarrassing, but Mexican beers are relatively expensive, but they have a lot of corn, so they break the Coors uh, to Guinness relationship. So, um, Corn is a, an absolutely incredible plant. If you haven't watched this movie, King Corn, it's really worth watching. Uh, they has it right. Corn rules the agricultural world. The United States is by far the largest producer of corn in the world. It produces slightly less than half of the corn in the world. The land use for corn production only in the United States is about the size of Arizona. And corn is very heavily subsidized because it's really energetically expensive to produce at an industrial scale. The Mayans, um, even now, invest one unit of energy and have a, a, a one to eight return. They get eight units of energy in return. The Amish don't do quite so well, but they do pretty well. They get five units of energy per unit of energy invested. And um, in Missouri, industrial agriculture, in, in contrast, gets about three units of energy back per unit of energy uh, invested. And this is a bit problematic because we need to feed a growing population and energy, as you all know, might be running out. So let's finish the talk. I promised to talk about Big Macs. And so let, let's finish the talk with a nice topic look at a McDonald's meal. We start at the Big Bang. Let's finish here in the Big Mac. And let's begin by analyzing a whole McDonald's meal. Um, so uh, let's begin by the big cold cup of Coca-Cola. And it is mostly corn, isotopically. And the reason for that is because it's sweetened with high fructose corn syrup. Um, now let's look at the shake. Uh, my children like shakes. I don't like them to drink shakes, but they do like shakes. Again, it's mostly corn, 78% if you do the isotopic analysis. Uh, let's do chicken McNuggets. Um, they're over 50% corn, 60% corn. Even the mustard is 60%. Uh, oh, well, let's do the, the hamburger. Look, we have wheat in the buns. And still, it is more than 50% corn. The mustard is 65% corn. Even the damn spots, uh, the, the french fries, are about 23% corn. And the reason, of course, is that they're being fried in corn oil. So um, I think that the Mac Nation is a lot like the Maya in that their flesh is corn. I'm saying their flesh because I eat mostly locally. I don't eat a lot of fast food, so I'm probably mostly antelope and elk, but, uh, which I'm pretty proud about. <laughs> anyway, uh, the only difference between the Maya and the Mac Nation is, is that the corn grown to make Mac Nation flesh is made with enormous inputs of fossil fuels. So I hope to have convinced you that by counting neutrons, we can discover surprisingly um, very useful and interesting connections. We can really link the Big Mac with a big bank. Thank you very much. And I think we have plenty of time for questions. Yes? We'll start in the front end. OK, so we can determine where we're from based on the heavy and light isotopes. But let's say you live in Jackson. You're eating food that's coming from California oh. and New York. Aren't you? Yeah, let me mention, this is a, th that's a great, that's a very, 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 very good question. Um, the isotopic composition of deuterium and oxygen 18 in, in humans, because we have what we call the supermarket diet that homogenizes the isotopic composition, is determined by tap water. So the tap water is the main determinant. Now, if you look at, uh, uh, if you look at indigenous populations that eat locally, they depart from this relationship. And they depart very significantly. So when you look at Inupiaq, uh, they have a very different isotopic composition. They don't follow this because they do not ingest the supermarket diet, which is homogenizes. It, it, this is something that I, I think, I'm so, uh, sorry to get philosophical, but it's something that strikes me as very, very interesting. Isotopically, uh, the isotopic composition of our bodies very strongly reflect that we are not local inhabitants anymore. Uh, we, are, we have become homogenized because of the 
Safeway, Albertsons, and, and so on, died in Western cultures. And does that answer your question? Yes, so if you're reading Health and Antelope, then you are global. Yeah, yeah, my, my, wife, not, my wife is obsessive about this locabore thing, which I think has become a fundamentalism, like many others, but I like killing elk, so and it works. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, sorry. Yes. Question. The Big Bang Theory has been around for a while. That's right. The scientific community around the world is it largely accepted, or is there a noticeable dissent? I think that the, the people that have won the new Nobel Prize are adding a, a, a nuances to it. I think that it's, let me put it this way, we scientists have no word of honor. And that doesn't mean that we are dishonorable people. What it means is that we accept not, we accept the hypotheses and theories that have the best evidence behind them. And so far, this is the best we have. Now, I'm not telling you that this is the only model of the world. This is the best one we have now, and it might change. But so far, I think that the consensus is we have nothing better. And the, the weight of evidence supports the Big Bang relative to all possible alternative hypotheses. Sorry to hedge my bets on this, uh, but that's, that's the way we function. I would be lying to you if we tell you, oh, this is the absolute truth. Anything I tell you, it, I, will, I will not tell you this is the absolute truth. I tell my students, if you want the absolute truth, move to the, to the theology department. Or, uh, in, 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 science, <laughs> in science, we don't do that kind of stuff, right? I mean, you remember that Indiana Jones movie? That he tells them, you know, I'm an archaeologist. I look in, at the evidence and then assess hypotheses. If you want truth, go to the religious studies department. And um, so, sorry, this is the best we have. Thank you. Yeah. Doctor, I'm really interested in the, in the feather isotope analysis. Yeah. And, uh, I guess I've got two questions, because I've always had a problem with the leaps of faith we make with bird banding data. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so how expensive and difficult is it to do with it? And do you know if any of these might be incorporated into the banding protocols <coughs> to get the, uh, isotopic feather data? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. We can run a deuterium sample now for about 12, 12 bucks. If we add oxygen 18, it's about 15 bucks. So it's not, it's not horribly expensive. And it, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper as, uh, as time goes by. And now what you have is all these banding stations are collecting feathers and sending them. So pretty soon we will have isoscapes not made with rainwater but with actual feathers immediately after the birds have molted. And so we will have really remarkably well documented maps from North America. I don't want to lie to you guys in that we can tell whether this uh, bird uh, migrated from Ames, Iowa or 200 <coughs> kilometers south. This is a pretty coarse tool uh, as you can see. We can tell within, you know, we have a certain boundary of about from 200 to 500 kilometers of accuracy. Yeah? This is a little off topic, but I'm wondering if you have an opinion on the science that's being done on the neutrinos in Italy and how that might change the way we understand physics. <laughs> yeah, that, that is beyond my job description <laughs> as a dumb biologist by far. Uh, I think it's very, very interesting, but I don't think that it will change. I think that, you know, the way science works is we'll probably. Um, we'll probably have a lot of better ideas about the Big Bang, but it will not change uh, what we understand about, uh, about isotopes and stable isotopes that much. It, it's very, very, very exciting. We, we're really gonna get an inkling about how these things are created. So, yeah. It seems like isotopes can tell us what we have been doing, yeah. but is there any use for them to show us genetically what we should be as a particular biological person. No. And they just, tell you, they just tell you what you ate in the past. One of the things that we do a lot in the lab, which I am really, really excited about, is that different... Sorry, I'm deflecting your question. The answer is no. So I'm just telling you something new that I think is, is novel in the lab that we find is very interesting, which is that different tissues turn over differently. And so you can take different tissues from a, an animal. For example, you can take a feather, uh, a blood sample, and, and, and they tell you, for example, one of the things we're doing in South America is you catch a bird in the, in the winter, and you catch a feather that was deposited in the summer. And you take a blood sample, which is, and then you release the bird, which is, to me, great. My death karma is bad enough as it is. And, um, and so you release the bird, 
And what you find is that the isotopic composition of the blood reflects what the animal is ingesting or the habitat is using now, but the feather reflects what it was using in the summer. So we're using it as a single measure by capturing the animal once to measure migration and habitat changes. It's absolutely cool. It's very, very spectacular what you can do. But yeah, no, I cannot tell you anything about what is good to eat or not. Yeah. The original map you showed about precipitation and the density of water being heaviest around Florida, yeah. light up in Alaska, doesn't that presume that the atmospheric flow of all the weather fronts is from Florida right. up to Alaska? Yeah. But that doesn't seem to jive. For example, here in Jackson, a lot of the storms we get seem to come from the West Coast. So why? Yeah, let me go to that. Why map. that pattern? It just doesn't seem to square. Yeah, right. let me let me show you that, that map again. It's a it's a very good question. It's a question that we grapple with a lot because we live in the West. Uh, I hope I can find it now, rapidly enough. Um, and you're absolutely right. This is average precipitation, average throughout the growing season. And it's, it's remarkably consistent, Dan. <laughs> it's remarkably consistent. I, I don't think you can see it very, very well. But if you, look at, um, if you look at the Rocky Mountain West, there is an almost fractal pattern. So the method that I'm describing works absolutely fantastically well in the eastern sea. It doesn't work at all in the Rocky Mountain West. It is very, very problematic. And let me just mention, at first we had a hell of a time uh, analyzing samples in, in the lab in, 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 in Laramie. And the reason is that the samples absorb a little bit of, of um, atmospheric air. And we didn't know that we had to freeze dry them, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, what was happening is that every time you had a storm coming from one side or another, our isotopic samples went up and down. It was completely crazy. And let me tell you some nuances that we have found. Um, Texas and Arizona game and fish are interesting white wing doves. People shoot them a lot and get a lot of money out of them. And so they asked us, is it happening, the decline that you find in Texas in those species, is it happening in the wintering grounds in Mexico, or is it happening in Arizona? So we analyzed a, a large number of feathers from these guys um, from Arizona that they sent us from hunter uh, stations. And lo and behold, and this is a question I would like to ask the audience, lo and behold, the darn Arizona desert birds that were feeding in agricultural <coughs> grounds had Colorado isotopic signatures. How come? Well, they're feeding on water from the Central Arizona project that is coming from the Colorado River. They look like snow melt. So one has to use this tool very, very carefully. And um, I was talking with Bob this morning that I was feeling like a scientist. We're always nuancing everything. We are the ultimate nuancers. Uh, and what I'm giving is a pretty Mickey Mouse version. This has a lot of nuances and little details that have to be worked out every time you use the tool. It's not, it's not a silver bullet. Yeah. Is corn going to feed 7 billion people? I don't know if anything can feed 7 billion. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a very problematic thing. We, we really need to, um, our agricultural systems will be very, very stressed, I think. Now, economists think that everything will be all right. But I'm, I'm, I'm a biologist, so I'm a lot more pessimistic about things. So. Yeah. There was this beautiful program, this absolutely beautiful, this is uh, the coalescence of a bunch of evidence. There was this beautiful program where little kids put little bands in the wings of, of the monarchs and they release many, many, many monarchs. But once again, you know, finding one marked monarch was very, very difficult. So people had the inkling. There's one more example that I think is, is really, really interesting. I will show you in, in just a second. I have a slide made out of it. People had an inkling that they were coming from the United States, but people were not absolutely sure. And the isotopes just put the nail in the coffin. In science, as a, we like um, 
we laugh, but the truth is at the intersection of many lies. So we have many, many sources of evidence that suggest that. And isotopes, I'm not suggesting it's the only evidence, it's just one of them. But there's one example that I think is very, very, very nice, which is that monarchs in the eastern, um, in the eastern United States appear late. And people were wondering if they were coming from Mexico or they were coming from somewhere else. And isotopes have shown, I hope to get this slide right, but people using isotopes have found that they are second generation monarchs that are coming from the Midwest that are moving into the eastern seaboard. So the monarchs that appear in New Jersey and Connecticut and so on are Midwestern monarchs that come and produce a second generation. And isotopes reveal that very clearly. So you can use isotopes for that. But you're absolutely right. It's not the only source of evidence. Any more questions? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, guys.